Welcome to the Low Carb USA podcast, where we seek to inspire you to help us build this community. I'm Doug Reynolds. And this is Pam Devine. Okay, so let's get this going. Christian, welcome. Thank you so much for making the time in the middle of the night for you pretty much to, to do this talk with me. I know you're so busy. Um, oh, pleasure. Something that's interested me and I think will interest a lot of other people is, is how you how you discovered this and, and uh, why, or why and how you've introduced it into your, into your practice? Well, um, I'm, for the people to know, I'm, I'm an interventional cardiologist and um, I think I've always been an active guy, a sports guy. I always uh, look for my health. I like looking good. I'm, I mean, I would say vanity. There's a certain extent that I always thought or think that vanity um, helps people achieve certain goals of health. I mean, not many people throughout my training would care what their labs look like. They would care more what they look like in the mirror. And I think um, just concepts, and, and that was the first thing that hit me. I mean, and, and I think it was 2017. Um, I told this in a podcast with Vinny Tortorich, and it's like um, I was getting the dad bod. I'm like, hell freaking no, you know? Uh, I'm following my recommendations. I'm uh, like really decreasing my caloric intake. I'm getting these apps to track my 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 calories and um, eating uh, cereal or uh, grains and the oatmeal and uh, skim milk and just uh, trying to keep it as light as possible. Uh, at the end of the week goes by and I'm so like, what the hell's going on here? I'm not losing weight and I look the same, but I just feel miserable. So uh, that's when it hit me. It's like, you know what? This, this stuff is not working. I'm active. I work out. I, I exercise. I try to behave as much as I can. It's not like I'm abusing anything. So, I mean, if the definition of insanity is trying the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, well, that's what actually got me into doing something different. Now, I must admit, when I first tried this, I, the only thing I did is I had no idea about low-carb ketogenic diet, the physiology about it. Um, I just said, you know what, I'm just going to decrease my calories. I mean, my, my carbs. And that's what I did at first. I just decreased it to uh, 100. Why 100? I have no idea. That number just came to mind. But then 100 turned to 80. Then, uh, um, there's for people that want a more prolonged story, they can go to YouTube bed hacker. And I did a video for the American Heart Association regarding this, but, and uh, long story short, I just started decreasing, decreasing, decreasing the amount of carbs. And then what I noticed is, uh, like particular days, I was actually prolonging my, my breakfast. And then I forgot, and it was 12 or 1 p.m. already, and I hadn't eaten breakfast. I'm like, before, I, w I mean, I suffered migraines since I'm 12. And now I'm skipping breakfast. I'm not getting migraines. I have the energy, I mean, unbelievable energy. And I'm just shedding weight, you know. I mean, I lost about 30 pounds in three months. I, I, I felt extremely energetic. My migraines were gone. Uh, I'd, uh, I had a lot of um, focus and energy. And that is what initially I actually wrote a post. And I'm like, hey, I discovered uh, the Holy Grail. I Honestly, I thought I, I had been, uh, I, I had discovered something. And well, as you start reading, you realize like, Jesus, dude. I mean, this has been going on since 1850. Yeah. Uh, but that is the most, pathetic thing of them all why don't we hear about this stuff in med school in training in, in fellowship and in, in residency uh when it has such an, a tremendous power so i was telling to you about um so i had this uh, like significant changes in my my overall health even my my brother's like what on earth are you doing i mean uh, he's also like a sports billy and, and loves uh, to exercise and he could not believe the changes that I mean, I, I underwent. And um, so people started asking me, what are you doing? Friends, family, uh, cousins. And I'm like, you know what? I'm now I know this is something called intermittent fasting and I'm combining intermittent fasting with low carb and I'm basically developing moments of ketosis by doing so. I'm not, I, the, the only day that I tried to count or quantify my fat intake was the last day I did. It's like, I, I, I remember getting a ribeye, trying to weigh in and, and figure out uh, my grant. So I'm like, hell no, I'm not doing this. So <laughs> I can tell you, I've never uh, quantified anything. 
I, I firmly believe in, in listening to my body. And once you're giving it good food, real food, whole food, the body responds physiologically and tells you when you should be eating and when it should not. And, and this is my experience with patients. So can I just chip in quickly here? You, you said that you, you kept reducing the carbs progressively. Mm-hmm. Um, did you start adding healthy fats uh, back in um, automatically or did you only start doing you know, that? No, I think the see? body, you, you do that on your own without even thinking. Like okay, if you so remove you carbs. Automatically. So I just eat more salmon. I was eating more, more vegetables. I was right. eating more greens. So I was fake, basically I focus on green vegetables and any animal. That's, that's, that's my summary. So mm-hmm. I say you focus on the fruits that end up in airy, two handfuls. You focus on the green vegetables, nothing that grows beneath the earth. And you eat any animal that you want. Now, if you're vegan, good luck. I mean, you can figure that out. I mean, I'm not, I mean, I'm, I really don't. Uh, besides my Hispanic population, I'm Mexican. We don't do vegan. I mean, no, if you find one Mexican that is actually going to live carne asada alone, well, that's a, a rare species, you know. So yeah. it's because of my setting. But if, if, a, if a patient um, wants to do vegan i mean i i support any way of eating and i try to find what works best for my patients but in in this aspect what i what i did is so in 2011 approximately there was a publication as i was telling you which obesity is spread through social networks uh the author was james fowler and uh it's very interesting study like if you have a sibling or a wife or a spouse you have like a 30 percent chance of developing obesity up to 40 50 percent so even if your social networks, it's very interesting. Like if you have your friends and your, your friends are actually smiling in your profile pic, like you have a higher chance of actually being smiling in the profile pic. Like it's like those things that get engraved in us. So um, I, I said, you know what? Well, if, if that is spread that way, well, the same thing to a certain extent, the research showed that it applies for healthy. So if you have like a healthy subgroup, you were more likely to be healthy. So what I wanted to do with this is like, you know what? Uh, I'm going to use like this type of social network and spread healthiness. If, I mean, and so my, my friends, my family, my cousins is like, Hey, I want to do this. It's like, I, I don't have the training right now to tell you exactly what to do. I can tell you what I did, but I do not really know the data. I don't, I don't, it's like, I don't care. I want to do what you're doing. I'm like, well, if you want to be my guinea pig, be my guest. So I did that. And a total of 50 people enrolled in in Facebook, friends of mine. So I'm not scared about liability. It's like, you're getting into this under your own risk. I mean, I'm just telling you. It's like, man, I mean, you're my brother. You're my cousin. That's fine. And case after case after case after case, everybody showing tremendous results, improving uh, their lipid profile. Every meta, every variable of the metabolic syndrome is improving. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? I mean, I was really, really shocked. One of the things that is important to mention here is like, why, why was everybody improving? Because everybody was motivated to change. I think that is the key. So when people ask me about ketogenic diet, low carb, lifestyle, is it sustainable? Well, that's not the first question that you should answer. I have arrived to this conclusion. The first uh, thing that you need to ask is how motivated are you? Why are you making the change? If you do not know why you're making the change and you just think it's because you're getting healthier and that's your goal, no, you're going to fail. You're going to go back to eating crap. And that's, that's basically my, uh, my experience. So I'll talk about that in, in a minute on how, how I approach the matter. But once I saw those results, I'm like, this is, is time to, to, to start digging deeper. And I think the first couple of books that I was reading on that time was David Perlmutter's uh, Grain Brain and then uh, uh, Jason Fung's uh, Obesity Code. And I contacted Obesity, I mean, Jason Fung, and he, he has been very helpful. I mean, he, he uh, gave me recommendations and I just then started reading more and more. And then I did this uh, course of the Nutrition Network uh, with Tim Noakes and uh, amazing speakers there. Actually, that was the first time I saw Brett Scher and Brian Lenskis and, um, well, I mean, a lot of the low-carb people. So I, I looked at what they were presenting. I looked at all the articles that they were presenting. So after they gave the talk, I went and I, I started like looking at the research and looking at the papers and paper after paper after paper. I mean, now I have a huge library. And... It is just shocking uh, how the data is there. So once you have the data, now you have the courage to implement. 
And why? Because you're not making anything up. I mean, this, this stuff is there. Uh, uh, there's publications left and right and how, how it can improve very, basically every variable of the metabolic syndrome. And I live in McAllen, Texas, most obesity in the United States. Most, I mean, the, the, the obesity in kids, diabetes, even Hispanics have a predisposition for fatty liver. So you can imagine the catastrophe that I see here. I see patients at 30s, 32, 33, 34 having heart attacks. And that's the moment when I realize, you know what, I, I need to, I mean, I'm an interventional cardiologist. I'm trained to open up the vessels, but no, I mean, what's the point in opening up a vessel if it's going to be occluded again in a year? Now, I mean, so the satisfaction that you get as an interventional cardiologist, I think varies tremendously depending on where you are. If you're in California and you get an 80 year old who has been healthy and you saved his life, you know that he's going to live a healthy lifestyle. I see a 30 year old with a heart attack. He's going to be back in a year if I don't change his lifestyle. So I need to figure out, or I needed to figure out how, how to do this. And um, once the knowledge uh, was there uh, and patients actually started asking me, it's like, what are you doing? I mean, I'm doing something different. It's like, well, I want to do what you're doing. And the, the, it, it was um, until I had significant amount of knowledge and um, you have to be comfortable and know that that data is there to implement it with your patients. I don't think there's a physician out there that can easily implement this to their patients if they haven't read because with the knowledge that we come out from med school, from fellowship, from training, from residency, it's not enough. There's no way on earth. I mean, I, I would be... Uh, I mean, scared to actually implement it. So you need to read, learn, and, but now I think things have changed. I mean, I think it's tremendously important that the American Diabetic Association has incorporated low carb into their guidelines. And uh, if you look at what's going on, if you see all the lifestyles, they're actually saying that it, it is the lifestyle that has the most uh, amount of research uh, and data regarding the treatment of diabetes, type 2 and, and obesity. If you see at the parameters that it's helping, it's glycosylated hemoglobin, weight loss, triglycerides, uh, HDL improvement, uh, lipid profile improvement. So now there's really no excuse. And if somebody says low carb is not sustainable, first of all, low carb can be Mediterranean, can be vegan, uh, vegan, can be pescatarian, can be, you name it, you can just make a modification of it. So uh, keto. Well, the problem is when people say keto, once again, they are already focusing on people chugging down the butter stick. When keto can be, let's have my nice uh, broccoli with my cauliflower with olive oil, some olives, and let's have a nice piece of salmon. Who on earth would say that that is not healthy? Let's put some walnuts there. I mean, it's not. I mean, people that say ketogenic is, is first of all, not sustainable. They just do not understand how to how to eat. I mean, bottom line, you're, you have your vegetables, you have your nuts. And once you regain or recover your, your metabolism and your metabolic flexibility, you want to increase your carb intake, be my guest, increase your carb intake. Some people, some of my patients after a while, and, and they feel fine, they, they start incorporating a little bit more of, of potato, of rice, not a problem, but it depends on the individual. And we have to find what works best for, for each. So um, that's a quick uh, down and dirty of, of everything, I guess. No, yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, so once again, it, it seems like most of the practitioners that actually acknowledge the benefits of, of this low-carb keto lifestyle have almost all had some kind of personal epiphany first because it's not what you get taught at college it's not what what you what you think you know as a doctor it's not what you've been trained to to do and obviously that's something that we really need to change i mean we've published those clinical guidelines now for practitioners to use which has become you know really really useful and really popular for a lot of people but it's only you know, a few thousand doctors that have downloaded it and used it. And we need, we need, even to if you get, get it, it. beyond that. I mean, in order for a physician to implement it or to, with their patients, he needs to do it himself. Right. I mean, I, there's no way on earth, I think, that, that a physician can actually recommend it without experiencing it himself. Um, without knowing what uh, low sodium feels like, without knowing what a cramp feels like. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, as I told you, I, I did this on my own initially. 
So I did every stupidity that you can imagine. I mean, I, I did not take enough sodium. I was not taking uh, magnesium. I was, I mean, I had cramps. I had twitching. I had, I mean, and, and the data is there. I mean, yeah. we, so we just need like to- Like a bit of salt and suddenly all of that goes away. Is, exactly. I was the same. I was like three months into it, like really struggling with, with low blood pressure issues. And, when I, and then I learned about the salt thing. Yeah. And I went into the kitchen and I took like basically chugged a, took a handful of salt and, and washed it down with some water. And like within, within half an hour, I was, and I'd never had a problem with it again. It's, it's well, it's very interesting because one of the things that I started noticing when I was doing this is that I started having cravings. I started having cravings for tomato with salt. It's like, why the hell would I have cravings? Salt. You have your potassium and your salt. Mm -hmm. For some reason, I was actually having, I, I used to use no salt, which is a potassium supplement for salt because I'm a cardiologist and I'm supposed not to be taking salt, right? So, I mean, I was doing everything that I was told not to do. I mean, I was eating the fat of, the saturated fat of the, of the ribeye and, and I was eating bone marrow. And I was, I mean, like, trust me, when I was doing this, I'm like, what the hell am I doing? But when I saw the labs, it's like, Holy cow, like triglycerides are 40, HDL of 90, um, LDL, did they go up a little bit, about 80, I mean, to 90, I, I don't know, I mean, I couldn't care yeah, less, Yeah, but honestly. when, you know, you listen to people like Dave Feldman and the people that are really doing research on this, and it's, it's becoming more and more apparent that, that the LDL is, is not a, a this, this is the way I see good it. Good marker. And um, let's say even the factor that, oh my God, LDL is going up. Okay, let's be realistic here. Insulin sensitivity improves, so insulin goes down, which, by the way, that affects your coagulation pathway. The same applies for hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia goes down, which also affects your coagulation pathway. Your blood pressure goes down. Your HDL goes up. Your triglycerides go down. You lose weight. You're more energetic. I mean, I have seven against one. <laughs> exactly. I mean, uh, so I'm not saying that uh, LDL is not, playing a role in atherosclerosis, but so are the seven guys here. I mean, uh, so yeah, it's all in context. I, you know, in a low carb environment, it's one thing. If you eat, if you're still eating a bunch of carbs then all bets are off, you know, then LDL could quite, quite possibly be. And let's say I, I have a patient that is really concerned. They don't want to take a statin. You know what works great? Psyllium husk and uh, red yeast, which to a certain extent, it works like lower statin or I don't know what statin, but I mean, uh, psyllium husk, uh, just fiber. I mean, it can decrease. I mean, I've seen it, uh, 20%. I've had patients decreasing their LDL wow. from 200 to 100 just with psyllium husk and red yeast. So, um, it's like, if, if we get to a point, uh, about worrying about LDL, we need to take all the other variables into context. I mean, we could just not say that the LDL of a metabolically inept individual is, as uh, harmful as somebody like, I don't know, sack bitter or like a ketogenic yeah. super athlete, which mm -hmm. is a lean mass hyper responder. I mean, we do not know that information. And will we? Uh, I don't know. It's going to be tough doing a randomized control trial about that. But yeah, uh, no, it, 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 that, that's the thing. It's like, you know, the ethics come in here as well. You can't kill a bunch of people to try and to show that a particular thing works or doesn't. Right? And in my case, my grains are gone. I've suffered migraines since I'm 12. Even if my cholesterol was 220, I wouldn't give a crap. I'm not kidding. Why? Because my migraines were, I mean, I suffered. I, I yeah. suffered for 25 years or more with those godforsaken things. And, and this way of life for me has been, has been a life changer. So it's, it's, it's taking things into consideration and uh, educating the patient and making um, an assessment and how we're going to approach the matter. Yeah. So well, that's brilliant. You know, it's so cool to have, it's always good to have more cardiologists like you and Brett Scher, um, on board because it's always the first excuse that people come up with when you start talking about it low carb, because that includes increasing the fat intake. It's like, Oh, I'm going to have a heart attack, you know? And it's really good to have educated cardiologists now that can point to that and say, no, actually maybe not so much, you know? that uh, is more involved in this whole thing than just LDL. It's about health. It's about how you are. I mean, initially, my colleagues are like, you're going to kill somebody. But then they started sending me their parents to me. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's yeah. I, I don't think there's, there's a, a, 
uh, more accurate um, assessment of, of what you think about a physician. If you're sending him your parents, that, yes. that says a lot. Totally, so, that says it. Yeah. yeah. So, Christian, thank you so much for being a part of this. Um, I'm super excited to meet you in person and hear uh, what you've got to say at our event in Boca Raton in January. And um, just if people want to get hold of you and maybe just, I'll, I'll put it in the show notes as well, but just if you could verbalize it here, uh, your Twitter accounts and TikTok and all of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, I mean, people can find me anywhere. Basically. I think that the one I stopped using is LinkedIn. That just annoyed me, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm not active in LinkedIn at all. I mean, that's, that's okay. buried, but if they want to find me, I have, um, um, it's webpage medhacker.com. That's where I actually did the post when I was first experiencing this and I, I thought I developed the Holy Grail. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, but it's a very good post. Um, that you can also find me on Twitter, Christian Assad. I'm very active in Twitter. Uh, Instagram, medhacker. Uh, TikTok, yeah, I'm in TikTok as well, medhacker. Um, and Facebook as well. There's a Gary Metabolic Clinic uh, page. So, in so it, it, there's so many networks now that I, I might take some time and can't even keep up. I, yeah. I'll, I'll put a few of them that I know about in the show notes. Yeah. And uh, thank you again for being with us and look forward to meeting you uh, next month. Yeah. Awesome. It's going to be a great uh, event. No doubt about it. Cheers, mate. Thank you. You've been listening to an episode of the low carb USA podcast. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash low carb USA.